We are reading a book called Bonhoeffer on the Christian Life, Dietrich Bonhoeffer from the World War II days in Germany. And the, the chapter that we read just last Wednesday was entitled, In Community, Life in the Church. In Community, Life in the Church. It was easy for me to see the correlation between that chapter on community and life in the church and what we're studying in the book of Colossians because Bonhoeffer talks about how life is to be lived together. In fact, he wrote about that in Life Together. He talks about the fact that the church exists, literally exists for each other. So the very reason that we are together is not for ourselves, it's for each other. And then he talked about the fact that you can't say that you love Jesus, but you don't love the church, which is sometimes a familiar theme today. In that last section of that chapter, he had a section that he entitled, People Are Exhausting. And uh, if life is going to be lived together, one of the realities is people can be exhausting, right? We all have experienced that. And then he says there are five ministries that we're all called to within the body. The ministry of holding your tongue, the ministry of meekness, the ministry of listening, the ministry of helpfulness, and the ministry of bearing with one another. So it just was easy for me to see that many of the things that he talks about in life together, life in community, are part and parcel with what Paul talks about in Colossians 3. So that's where we are again this morning. If you want to turn there to Colossians 3 or go to your device and find Colossians 3, verses 15 through 17 this morning, If everything we do as we relate to each other conforms to the character of Christ, then CCC, or any relationship that we're in, our homes, marriages, families, will certainly be a blessed place, will be a place of blessing. Let's start off by looking at the overriding theme of chapter 3 as we're working our way through this third chapter, it seems to me the overriding theme of chapter 3 can be captured in just a few words. The first word is the word already, the word already. And the Apostle Paul underscores our position in Christ. He underscores our identity in Christ. He opens up the chapter by talking a lot about who we are in Christ, that we have died with him, that we have been raised with him, that we are hidden with him, that we're going to return with him in glory. We noted last week in the 12th verse that we are the ones who have been chosen, that we're holy, that we're beloved. All of these words are describing for us this amazing truth of already. These things have already happened to us. It's underscoring who we are in Christ. We look at those things, and as I said last week, it's almost like we just need to stop and say, what else do we need to know? What else is there in light of who we are in Christ? And so it's all about identity and how important that is to understand our identity in Christ. I'm reading an excellent book right now called Parenting by Paul Tripp. And in fact, it's so good, I've ordered a case of them. And I hope that every family will get a chance to buy those when we get into Colossians 3.20. It's talking about parenting and children and, and, and all of that. And and in this fourth chapter, I think it is, this is he makes this comment. If, if you are not resting as a parent in your identity in Christ, you will look for your identity in your children. And you can just fill the blank in with anything that you want there. If you're not looking to your identity in Christ, then I can assure you, you're looking for your identity in something. And it's going to be in your children, it's going to be in your spouse, it's going to be in your job, it's going to be in your stuff, it's going to be in something. The believer comes back to this truth of already who we are in Christ, so fundamentally important. And then the other part of that equation is not yet, right? So Colossians 3 is all about already, but not yet. In other words, we're not perfect, are we? We haven't arrived There are, Paul reminds us, fleshly desires. There are emotional outbursts. There are disruptive behaviors. That's all of the things that he was talking about in verses 5 through 11. And as you read those things, it's shocking. (laughs) It's shocking that those things happen, right? They happen in our lives. They happen within our fellowship of believers, within our community. Christians act this way sometimes, hopefully not often, not always, 
because that is not who we are any longer in Christ. So aren't you grateful, though, that when you come to a section like this, and we've already heard already of who we are, but then we step back and we also see, but we're not yet there, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful that the Bible is brutally honest? Aren't you thankful that the Bible doesn't gloss over behavior, even in the church, even in our lives? Aren't you thankful for the fact that God just, there's no pretending with him. He just says, listen, I know who you are in Christ, but I also know you're not there yet. I also know you haven't arrived. I know you're not perfect. And I know these things will rise up as your flesh uh, takes over. So we're in process, right? Secondly, we're, we're in process. That's why we're told that these are things we're to continuously to put on. This is not a one-time wardrobe change, as we noted last week. These are things that we are putting on all the time. We're putting on compassion. We're putting on kindness. We're putting on humility. We're putting on a spirit of patience and gentleness. And we're doing all of these things in the power of God's Spirit. We're forbearing with one another. We're forgiving one another. And we're loving each other. That's maturity. That's Christ-likeness. It doesn't come easily. It does not come quickly. But as we walk with God, as we trust God's Holy Spirit to work in our life, to, to do this transforming work, that's what he will do. And that's what we're called to. And we're called to do it in community. That's the whole point of this third chapter. We're called to do this in community. Verses 9 through 17 might very easily be entitled Life Together. All right? So let's look. At verses 15 through 17 this morning, and I want us to note four priorities for life in the body. Four priorities for life in the body. When we talk about the body, we're using a spiritual metaphor in the New Testament that's talking about this spiritual body of believers. The Holy Spirit just takes our physical body as a picture and says, you know what? The spiritual body of Christ living in community is like your physical body. And it needs to work and function together to be effective. And so let's look. There are priorities for life in the body. And I would suggest that based on verse 15, the first priority is that we work towards a culture of peace. We, we work towards a culture of peace. Look at verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And you can see the connection in these verses, can't you? Because there's all these connective words that are at the beginning of the verses. And, and, and. So there's this idea that one verse is connected to another and to another and to another because it's underscoring life together. It's underscoring life in community. These things happen in this context of life together. So what is in view? Well, he speaks of the fact that we want the peace of Christ to do something in our lives. So let's just look at that little phrase, the peace of Christ. The idea of the peace of Christ or the peace of God or peace with God is, is a familiar language in the New Testament. And we can under, uh, understand it in about three different ways depending on the context. We, we read of the peace of God as, as Paul speaks about it in, in the first chapter in verse 20. He talks about the fact that we have peace with God. We have the peace of God as, as a result of what? As a result of the cross, as a result of trust in Christ. So it's talking about the fact that as we look to the future and as we think of life beyond this life, within our heart there is a sense of peace. Why? Not because we're working our way successfully to heaven because there's no peace there, but because we're trusting in Christ alone for salvation. And the penalty for sin has been dealt with, and there's no judgment that awaits us. And so we look to the future, and we think of death, and we think of life after, and we're at peace. That's called the peace of God. Another way this phrase is used is to speak of a more subjective inner peace. Paul does that in Philippians chapter 4. That God will give us a peace that goes beyond understanding. It will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So that is a peace that comes over us because we know God is sovereign. We know God's in control. Our life may be in some level of turmoil, but there is still the capacity for the believer to have a measure of great peace because we know even though things are out of control from our vantage point, they're not from God's. And so we have this peace that God gives to us. 
But I think the way Paul is using this phrase here in Colossians 1, uh, 3.15 is this peace of Christ is in fact talking about our relationships to each other. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And I think he has in view, because of the community that he's talking about, life together, he's talking about our one another relationships. He says in, in Ephesians 4, 3, that we're to be diligent, we're to work at maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So just think of this as being a relational thing. And just as you look at the context, it's, it's evident that there are things in this context that are not very peaceful, right? In, in, in verses 5 through 11, there's not very much peace being described in those verses. When there's wrath and there's anger and there's clamor and there's slander and there's lying, there's, there's no peace anywhere there, is there? Sexual immorality, impurity, evil thoughts, passions, all of that stuff. There, there's no peace there. So that's the contrast. And then when you look at verses 12 through 14, there is a description of peace because there there's compassion. There there's kindness. There there's humility. There's patience. There, there is a sense of forbearing with each other, forgiving each other, loving each other. What is that describing? It's describing peace, isn't it? It's describing a relationship that you have with others that could only be characterized as being you are at peace with each other. So that priority, he says, is what we're to focus on. Now, notice how it is that this is realized. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It's an interesting phrase. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That word rule is taken out of athletics, and it's a word for umpire. It's a word for referee. It's a word of someone who arbitrates, right? When we lived in Kansas, and we came to a point with our growing family that we felt like we needed a little extra income, I went ahead and got certified as a referee. And... Uh, worked some evenings and times when it was free in the schedule to go and referee basketball games. And I can still remember the very first game I refed, I'm running down the court, go by the coach's box, and he says, loud enough for me to hear, keep your day job. And uh, I, I, I didn't think I was doing all that badly, but, but he didn't want me to quit my day job because he didn't think I had a future in refereeing. So I ran by him all the way back and said, I'm a pastor. And, uh, <laughs> and I ran by the next time and he said, I'm sorry. And uh, I never knew if he was sorry for the people I was pastoring because he thought I probably was not a... But you see, what, what does a referee do? A referee arbitrates. A referee determines what's right and wrong in the context of that game. A referee says that's good, that's not good. You get the picture here? It's a beautiful picture. Let the peace of Christ arbitrate in your heart. Let the peace of Christ determine the things that come out of your mouth that you say to other people. That's 12 through 14, isn't it? Let the peace of Christ arbitrate the way you treat each other the way you behave towards one another. But what would happen if the peace of Christ was the referee in our life? Well, there'd be a lot of compassion. There'd be a lot of kindness. There'd be a lot of humility. There'd be a lot of patience. There wouldn't be any anger, malice, wrath, slander, lying. All that stuff would be gone because we have arbitrating in our life that which makes for peace. Why do we do this? He tells us, because you were called in one body. You were called in one body. In other words, we're called to be peacemakers. Ephesians 4.3, be diligent to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we're called to be peacemakers. Conflict is going to happen. Conflict is a part of life. Disagreements are going to happen. Disagreements are a part of life. You may be sitting very close to somebody this morning, maybe really, really close to somebody this morning that you have an ongoing disagreement with right now. 
Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, in your relationship with them. You know what a peacemaker does? According to Kent Sandy and the peacemaker ministry, peacemaker basically begins to look at any conflict with those four G's. Those four G's that say, first of all, whatever else happens in this conflict, I want to glorify God. Well, that takes a lot of stuff out of your vocabulary and it takes a lot of stuff out of your behavior because you're letting the peace of Christ rule because you want to glorify God with what you do and say. You, t- you get the log out of your own eye. Before you start working on the other person and all the things that are wrong with them, you get the stuff in your own life that needs to be in order, taken care of. That slows the process down even that much more, right? And then you're, you're, you're gentle in the way that you reach out to that person. You go and you're reconciled. Those are wonderful principles. But it's basically this idea. Let the peace of Christ arbitrate in your heart. What a wonderful priority to give ourselves to. The priority of what makes for peace. Second priority is the word of God. The second priority is the word of God. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So again, what's in view? What is in view here? What is the word of Christ? It's the only time it's used in the New Testament, that particular phrase. So it's not something that we can go to somewhere else and say, okay, this is what it means. So some people have looked at at this and said, this means the spoken words of Jesus. The word of Christ means the spoken words, almost like the red letter edition of your Bible. These are the words that Jesus spoke. Let these things be given priority, the word of Christ in your life. That's probably too narrow of a restriction. Uh, I think this could easily be understood as simply being the totality of God's revelation. For what is the Bible if it is not the word of Christ, the word of God to us? Paul says in the first chapter in verse 5, which has come to you as indeed the whole world is, is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So I think it's probably okay for us to look at this and say, this is the word of God to us. This is what he wants us to have a priority in this life together in community. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. All of what God has said to us. We know those five words, don't we? Let's just review them. The five words that describe the Bible. There is all through the Bible the story that God is going to send his son. All through the Bible the story is that there is a Messiah coming, a Redeemer coming, Christ is coming. So you have in the Old Testament anticipation. The whole Old Testament is anticipating his coming. He gets here and in the Gospels you have manifestation. He's here He's among us. You get to the book of Acts, and it's let's go tell everybody that he's here, that what he has done is proclamation. Then we get into the letters like we are, and we have the whole matter of explanation. Let's tell everybody all that they need to know about this. And finally, you have consummation when you get to the book of Revelation. So from Genesis to Revelation, what is it that is to be a priority? It's the word of God, the word of Christ to us. It takes me to, to, to Luke 24. And remember in Luke 24, Jesus, after the resurrection, the two disciples are walking along the road. They're all discouraged. They're in despair. Everything has gone wrong. And Jesus comes alongside them. And it says in Luke 24 that he began to show them from Moses and all of the prophets all of the things written about him. And it's just a beautiful picture of what is this book if it is not the word of Christ to us, if it is not God's message to us. So that is to be given priority. Then notice, how does this happen? How is this to happen among us? Let it, he says, let it dwell in you richly. I love that explanation. Let this word dwell in you richly. And then he describes it further, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. That takes me back to chapter 1 and verse 28. When Paul said that it is him that we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So here we have the word of God that is to be given a priority in life together. 
in community with each other, and it is to dwell within us. That's a very descriptive word, to reside in this truth. John 15, Jesus talking about abiding in Him as He abides in us. Let His words abide in our lives. It's talking not about something static and unchanging. No, it's talking about an encounter with this word every time we open its pages. There is something dynamic. There is something alive. There is something powerful. Let it dwell in you. Live in it. Reside in this truth. Traffic in the truth that God has given to us, this word of Christ. And if you're going to grow in your walk with God, and if you don't care about growing, then you don't probably care about the Word of God. But if you care about growing, and if you want to grow, there's only one way you can grow. And that is you've got to eat of the Word that is the sustenance of your spiritual life. The measure of our desire to grow is the measure of our love for God's Word. The measure of our desire to grow is measured by what level of commitment is there that I get this word into my life on a daily basis? Because there is no way to dwell in God's word richly if we're never in God's word. And that's what he underscores, doesn't he? It's not just dwell in it, but dwell in it richly. And I take that to mean the beauty of God's word, the glory of God's word, the wonder of God's word, the abundance of God's word. It's all there for us takes me to Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord are pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. The rules of the Lord are true, sweeter than honey. They're, they're to be desired because they're so sweet to our soul. Or how about Psalm 119 and verse 97? Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. That's the heart of the psalmist. That's what Paul is talking about here. The sharing of this word is to take place, he says, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And I don't think that means that you come on Sunday morning and at 9.30 you hear somebody teach the word. Well, it means that, but that's not all it means. You notice specifically he's talking about life in community. He's talking about life together, and he said you're teaching the word to each other. You're admonishing each other. You're sharing God's truth with each other. So all of us share in that responsibility. If you don't know the word, then you got really nothing to share in that regard, do you? Again, the motivation, if we're to fulfill this responsibility to each other, to teach and admonish and encourage and warn and bless, then we have to know what that word is, don't we? Okay, so we have the priority of peace. We have the priority of the word. We have the priority, thirdly, of the culture of singing. Yeah, get that. Verse 16, so here's life together. Here's a snapshot of, of what should be happening in the body of Christ. So verse 16 he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So again, what's in view? Well, pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty straightforward. We're to be a singing church. Yeah, we're to be a singing church. From Genesis to Revelation, God's people were singers. You see, singing all the way through the Bible so that you have Israel coming out of Egypt and they go through the Red Sea. And what do they do in celebration? Wow, they make a joyful noise to the Lord. There is this great time of, of singing and worship in what God has done. You have Deborah and Barak defeating Sisera. And what do they do? They break out in song. You have Solomon in the dedication of the temple. David had already gotten all the musicians all lined up and categorized and ready to go. Solomon finishes the temple and they have this great time of worship and singing. Nehemiah builds the walls. They finish the walls. What do they do? They have antiphonal choirs on the walls singing back and forth to each other. Paul and Silas are sitting in jail. What do they do? <laughs> they sing. So 
it's not surprising then that when Paul comes to this thing and says, you know, what does life together look like? What does life in community look like? Well, it looks like people singing. Wherever you are in the Scriptures, we have a whole book in the Old Testament called the Psalter, which is songs for Israel to sing to their God. Revelation 5, we're at the end of the age. The consummation of all things is at hand. What are the people of God doing? They're around the throne, and they are singing. So here we go. We're to sing. You notice it doesn't say, and it never does, You can't find any place in the Bible where it talks about singing and it talks about ability being a prerequisite, all right? It never, now your spouse may have some prerequisites for you in terms of singing, but there aren't any here, okay? So make a joyful noise to the Lord. This will never happen to you at covenant. You will never be put in this position So if we can look at that cartoon, you will never have this happen to you at Covenant. You will never be singled out for remedial singing in the narthex basement, okay? That's not what we do here. You just lift up your voice and praise to God. How do we do this? He speaks here of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Songs, hymns, spiritual songs. All kinds of definitions have been offered. I'm not going to take time this morning to add to what you can already discover if you just look this up. Dissertations have been written about what it means when he says psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There are church traditions that all they sing are psalms out of the Old Testament. They do it in part based on a passage like this. We're to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Well, I'm not sure that that's exactly the way this is to be understood. Uh, The fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, you can't be dogmatic about what Paul means here because we just don't have that given to us uh, by way of a, a specific description. Here's my take on it. My take on it would simply be that we are to sing a variety of songs. There's different ways that we express to God in song our heartfelt worship to Him for all that He has done. But they should all fit the basic description of what he's described here. They should be building us up. They should be a sense of encouragement. They should bring us into an encounter with God's truth. They should cultivate and promote spiritual health within the body as we sing these songs of praise to God and actually, in some respects, to each other as we lift our voices together. Someone has likened songs to health and nutrition and put songs into three categories, what they called empty calorie songs. Just nothing there. And frankly, we shouldn't be singing them. You shouldn't sing empty calorie songs. I don't care how popular they are on K-Love or any other station, whatever other stations are out there. If there's nothing there, then we don't need to sing it. We're looking for spiritual health. We're looking for, for vitality in what we sing to God. Not something that just happens to be popular because some artist who may be well-known or not well-known has written it. He says, secondly, there are songs that are literally poisonous, that their theology and their doctrine is is not just weak, it's it's dangerous, and it's poisonous. We don't want to sing stuff like that. The last category he talked of was nutritious, nutritious songs, songs that are doctrinally solid, that, that speak to a theology that is reflective of what God has given us in his word and that, that encourage and build us up. And I don't know about you, but when I go through my week, invariably there's a song that we have sung on Sunday morning that gets into my head and I, I, I find myself going over it and over it and over it. There, there's just something that happens as the people of God come together in that way. Albert Moeller said, some songs have no capacity for heresy because they don't have enough theology to even be heretical. And that's the kind of stuff we don't want, do we? We want the stuff that really represents the me. So why? Let me, just, let me just say something about why singing is so important. Paul's not giving us these specific things, but I think they're a part of what he's saying here. The first is that music allows us to minister to each other. It allows us to minister to each other. Paul says that very thing back in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. And in verse 18, he says, Don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, 
giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's a dynamic that happens that as we sing and as we lift our voices in praise to God, we're encouraging each other in that very same process. I think secondly, and most importantly probably, is that music that's good, that's nutritious, that's healthy, is pointing us to God. It's Godward in its focus. That's what the psalmist says in Psalm 40 in verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. They're directed to God. They're directed to Jesus. They're directed in some measure to the Holy Spirit. That is the way that we are to view this time together. The, the fact that we have a song set week to week is reflective of a priority that God says we're to be a singing people. The fact that we have a song set at the beginning of our worship time is not a cushion, a buffer, a filler till we get to the teaching of the Word. I just strongly disagree with that mindset that says, that's not really that important. What I'm here for is the Word. Well, listen, if you're here for the Word, then listen to the Word. The Word says you're to be a singer. And you can't be a singer if you're not here. And you can't encourage each other if you're not here to do that. So we don't build 15 to 20 minutes in at the beginning so that you can be late and not miss anything, I hope you come to realize that you're missing a lot if you're not here to lift your voice with ours. And then thirdly, music touches us, it seems to me, in a way that nothing else does. It, it, it touches our whole being. And I think, again, that's why it's so important that we value what God has said we're to do in community together life together. Music touches me physically, it touches me emotionally, it touches me spiritually, it touches my heart, my soul, my mind, my body. Now, I want to just say something that is just my personal thing, okay? We, we, we mention this occasionally, uh, I can't sing and sit anymore. At this point in my life, I can't sing and sit. Now, I'm not making a judgment about what you can do, okay? This is about what I can do. I can't sit and sing. I grew up sitting and singing. And everybody, when the director, the music guy said, okay, let's all stand on verse three. There was kind of a collective, oh, yeah, I gotta stand. And, they, and we'd, sometimes we'd be singing standing on the promises, you know, or, or, or something. We should have been singing, I'm sitting here, you know, on the promises. And I don't mean to say that everything a song says we have to physically act out, okay? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that music touches me at this point in my life in a, in a way that nothing else does. And I think it's by divine design. God intends for it to do that. And so we engage in this aspect of our worship, I hope, with a strong sense of appreciation. Because here's the thing. If, if a guest would just come in and see us in that first part of our worship time together, or whenever it is that we're singing, what kind of conclusions would they draw about what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it? I'd like to watch some of you as you watch your favorite team score a touchdown or a home run or a goal or whatever that looks like. Because you see, we bring a lot of passion and a lot of enthusiasm to the things that we love and that we're passionate about. And it's always been interesting to me the disconnect that happens for whatever reason when we walk in here at 9.30. And, and we can, and I'm, I'm not speaking in a broad generality that this is who we are, I'm just talking about the church in general, that the church can, can seem rather bland and rather uninterested and rather disengaged and rather apathetic. That, that's, that's tragic. I can assure you that when you get to heaven, you won't be worshiping the Son in anything other than wholehearted, full-bodied enthusiasm in praise to God. 
So this is a beautiful thing that Paul gives to us here, that a part of the culture of body life together is to be a singing church. I think we're a lot better singing church than when I came 25 years ago. I think we can be even a better singing church probably. So let's do that if we can. Number four, last one, priority of gratitude. There's gratitude, and, and I've held it to this point, this matter of, of what this is. I've, I've held this comment because it's all through this section. Did you notice that as we read? It's in verse 15, in our relationships to each other, be thankful. It's in relation to the word, be thankful. It's in relation to this, the word in singing, verse 16. It's in relation to everything. Look at what he says in verse 17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We're going to touch verse 17 when we go on in this study of Colossians because I think it's both a summary statement and it's a launching verse for what is to follow. Why are we to be a people of gratitude? Well, I think he's already given us the reasons, hasn't he? We're to be thankful for all that God has done, for his grace that has come to us. We're to be thankful for each other. We're to be thankful for the, the way that the gospel has come into our life and how God has made us his child and put us into his family. Psalm 33, 1, shout for joy in the Lord, you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord. And you know what? As we become a fellowship of God's people, and as we establish the priority of peace, the priority of the word, the priority of singing, and the priority of gratitude, you know what happens? There's a conforming work of God's Spirit moving us to greater Christ-likeness. And you know what happens then? It's the outpouring of God's blessing on relationships of all kinds. So what do we take away? It seems to me that as we wrap up this section of Colossians, that Paul would say to us again, at the center of all of life is Christ. At the center of all of life is Christ. What else matters? If Jesus isn't Lord of your life, really, what else matters? What is it? that you're going to take with you from this life to the next one. Absolutely nothing of this world, but everything as it relates to your relationship to God and to each other. Everything that is touched by the Lordship of Christ in your life, the investment that you make in being a person of peace, being a person of the Word, being someone who lifts their voice in song to God, someone whose heart is filled with gratitude and not complaining and grumbling, that's what's going to last a lifetime. So here is a great way for us to bring to a conclusion this section of Colossians by just asking God's Spirit to show to us any area of our life where we've laid claim for ourselves rather than submitting it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus is worthy of our praise. Jesus is worthy of our obedience. He is worthy to be Lord of every area of our life because of who He is. He is very God of very God. He is the Son of God. He is the Redeemer and He is the Savior. He is the focal point of the gospel, and that gospel is the good news. And it is that good news that we get to celebrate in the testimonies of these that are being baptized this morning that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no way to come to the Father except through him. And I trust this morning that you know the joy of that truth, that you have that peace in your heart. And if you do not, then I would encourage you to find someone after this morning service to talk to. I would encourage you to just open your own heart before God and to acknowledge what all of us have to acknowledge, that we have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But Jesus, in his death on the cross, did everything that was needed for us to have a relationship with him and to live with him forever. Let's pray. Father God, thank you again for this encouraging word. Lord God, among these people, 
who call Covenant Community Church their family. And those that we want to reach, Father, with this message of the gospel, may we be known as a people of peace, a people of the book, a people, Father, who can't help but sing praise to you, and, Father, a people of gratitude and thanksgiving. And we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.